I'm so delighted to present this conversation uh, between the editors of this fantastic title. Um, Domenico Lorenza is a historian of science um, with an interest in the history of art and visual culture. Um, he's an expert on Leonardo da Vinci's scientific work on the history in the Renaissance and on the history of geology. Um, sorry, could I just ask if everyone could mute their microphones, please? Thank you. Um, Martin um, is Emeritus Research Professor in the History of Art at Oxford University. He has written and broadcast extensively on imagery in art and science from the Renaissance to the present, and he speaks on issues of visualisation and lateral thinking. Um, this event is to serve as something of a book launch for this very exciting project for the press, which is a scholarly edition of Leonardo da Vinci's <laughs> Codex Lester. Um, this edition is made up of four volumes, a beautiful high quality facsimile volume of the Codex itself, a new transcription and translation of the text, a paraphrase and page by page commentary on the contents and a volume of interpretive essays. Lorenza and Kemp bring their unparalleled knowledge of da Vinci to this edition with new research and interpretations of Leonardo's scientific ideas and impact. The editors will each speak and then there will be a question and answer mm. section at the end. If you have any questions throughout the event, please feel free to type these into the chat box and I will ask these to the editors at the end. Um, and just as, as a final piece of housekeeping, if you could please keep yourself muted um, while the speakers are talking so we don't um, miss anything that they're saying. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you very much to our editors. And I'm going to turn this now over to Martin, um, who'll uh, start. Thank you. Now, Catherine, thank you very much. W welcome to the people who have actually made it. There was a danger of this being a, an event about an illegible manuscript with an invisible presentation, but I think some, some of us at least have made it. Um, we're calling this the most important scientific manuscript that has come down to us with Leonardo. And what we aim to show in this is exactly why we're saying that. I think it, it will come out as an unchallenged statement. Uh, the Codex Lester, what is it? Next. It's a complicated set of folded papers in the top left hand corner there. You can see a schematic diagram of, of, the, of the folded sheets, 38 sheets folded inside each other, which makes uh, 76 pages and a rough count of 7,000 words. So it is actually a book in in terms of scale and uh, and content. Uh, originally, or since the early 18th century, owned by the Earls of Leicester, who had it very splendidly bound, as you can see. It was bound sh probably shortly after Leonardo's lifetime. Anyway, this is the Leicester binding from which it was removed by the previous owner, Arm Armand Hammer. And uh, there is Leonardo, just to remind us who we're dealing with. And the the page you've got there is the outer sheet. So that's the the one you can see marks from the hand where they've been, um, where the hands have been running down the back of the spine before it had covers on. So this is what, what we're dealing with. The immediate background is it's purchased by Bill Gates in 1994. And his enthusiasm to make it available in a whole variety of forms, both exhibit it, but also to have publications and available so that uh, this difficult manuscript could be understood both by specialists and by, by the general public. Bill has been an excellent owner. Um, I won't say anything about the previous owner as that might be libelous. The, uh, the, the background to this is the initial efforts we made to put this in the public domain involved a codoscope. Next, please. Uh, now, Curtis Wong approached me not so long after Bill had bought it and said uh, we, he had this idea of doing a CD-ROM on the manuscript. Uh, Curtis is here and welcome, Curtis, and you're the godfather of this project, I think it's fair to say. And he came up with this very brilliant device called a codoscope. And you've got the window there. You can see it on the illustration. 
and you can move the window up and down. You can flip Leonardo's mirror writing over so it becomes the right way round, which means it's marginally easier to understand. You can transcribe it, which means it's that bit easier to understand. And you can translate it and that window moves up and down and you can choose to whatever you want to appear or both the background and the window, a, a very brilliant invention. But it doesn't need me to say that a CD-ROM is now a pretty obsolete piece of technology. We all thought it was state of the art and it was going to absolutely be triumphant in this area. And you can't tell. And um, it's very difficult now to actually read the CD-ROM. So having got to that point where all this research has been done, uh, Curtis then suggested that we should uh, do an edition with Oxford University Press. It's always nice to hear Italian, but not necessarily in the wrong place. Um, and this has been a long job with Oxford University Press. And why it's been a long job is partly the sheer complexity and magnitude of the task. It is uh, the most difficult manuscript you would never hope to encounter in terms of its paleography, in terms of its meaning, in terms of how we can interpret it and so on. Uh, the first step was the new transcription and Domenico will tell, we, we take joint responsibility for everything that's done in this, but obviously there's a division of labour. And I suggested that Domenico join me in this project because his skills with Leonardo's paleography, handwriting and so on is far in advance of mine. So Domenico, a bit on the transcription. The transcription, the, the transcription of the Codex Lester has been a fascinating work. Um, the transcription is something deeper than a normal uh, reading. You read the text, but you also uh, see how the ink changes. So something deeper than the normal reading, but also a very difficult uh, uh, work. Leonardo's text presents a lot of difficulties. Uh, um, pages full of uh, uh, text in minute uh, handwriting uh, written uh, backwards from right to left. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, you see highlighted the word dove, meaning where, written from right to left, D-O-V-E. Uh, next slide. If you open the codex, uh, you find uh, uh, astronomical studies. But if you turn the page, next, next slide, please, the subject changes. And for example, in the case, in this case, you find hydrological studies. In the Codex Lester, there is no continuity of discourse between one page and the next. Another problem is Leonardo's vocabulary. His Italian is very different from modern Italian. Uh, Unlike the two previous editions, we uh, transcribed Leonardo's text as close as possible to, uh, as literally as possible, but at the same time remaining alert to the needs of the modern readers. In other words, we tried the balance between respect of the original and uh, needs of the modern re reader. Uh, not an easy task, eh, as you can imagine. Uh, next. Ecco, eh, other problematic aspects are uh, very damaged text, like uh, those uh, you see here, uh, almost invisible. In this case, uh, thanks to the use of the microscope, uh, special light, uh, like uh, the raking light, and also thanks to the use of old manuscript copies dating back uh, to the 18th century, uh, to a period where, where when the, con the condition the co conservation of the cause of the codex were better than today, thanks to all of these, uh, we proposed new transcriptions for these problematic passages. Of course, proposal, all these proposals uh, remain open to debate with other scholars, more than present uh, uh, themselves as in, the, in a definitive way. 
especially thanks to the uh, online edition, the e edition of the book uh, planned by Oxford University Press for the next uh, year. Martin uh, will uh, later say something more perhaps on this. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Next. Uh, uh, sorry, the previous one, the previous one. Thanks. Uh, during the examination of the codex, uh, we made little discoveries, for example, uh, um, unknown drawings made by Leonardo using a, a metal point and then non, not reworked with the pen, with the ink, uh, like the one you see here on the right, uh, highlighted in black. Uh, next. We also discovered three fingerprints, uh, at least the one you see here um, with an ink uh, uh, which is the same of the nearby text could be Leonardo's uh, fingerprint. Uh, next slide. And this is uh, an example of the uh, of a page of a uh, transcription from the new edition we um, divided the, the text in in into uh, numbered sections uh, corresponding to natural breaks in the original codex or clear uh, changes in content of course uh, you will find the same division in the in the in the translation the english translation in the in the paraphrase and uh, in the commentary so the, the transcription has been the, the first step. Uh, uh, the second step was the uh, tra English translation and uh, the paraphrase. Uh, Martin can explain better than me uh, on these other parts of the codex. Thank you, Domenico. Um, the translation, we decided to do it as literally as made sense um, to keep it close to Leonardo's Italian. Domenico has already referred to the vocabulary. One of the problems for Leonardo is he's discussing things in Italian, which were sometimes discussed in Latin, but he's always having to forge his own vocabulary. At one point, he lists, I think it's something over 70 terms for the movement of water. He's wishing somehow verbally to as well as visually to capture this extraordinary chaotic variety of, uh, of water. So compared with other translations, we've been pretty literal. There are terms like percussioni, percussion, which you could translate as blow. Um, and given the fact we decided to do it very, the translation pretty literally, I came up with a paraphrase. That is to say, rewriting the translation in terms which are understandable uh, in modern language and modern scientific language because you could give an educated reader the translation and it still becomes very difficult to make uh, sense of it and you know, the paraphrase i think hasn't been done before but it's it's an interpretive tool it's not an alternative to to reading the reading the original um, we also undertook a commentary which runs parallel to the manuscript, saying what's in, giving the headings, treating all Leonardo's uh, diverse ways of assembling a page, working out which order the object, the text and diagrams came onto the page, which seems almost impossible. Once you get going on it, you can actually work out pretty closely the sequence of things as they join the page in this very remarkable um, Leonardo Manor, and we've written some interpretive essays. Uh, it's a, it's a, you can get some sense of the size of the enterprise and why it's taken a, a long time. Uh, the unifying theme in the Codex Lester is water. The astronomy, as we will see, actually is quite heavily concerned with water, and the geology, unsurprisingly, is concerned with water. Uh, Domenico, you're going to tell us about the geology. Yes, uh, next slide, please. Geology, geology is uh, with anatomy, perhaps uh, the most advanced field of uh, Leonardo's uh, scientific uh, work, but uh, one of the least studied. Uh, therefore, in the new edition, uh, we, uh, we have devoted much attention to this uh, less known aspect of the Codex Lester. 
Leonardo understood that the uh, marine fossils of uh, fish and shells uh, found in the mountains were the uh, remains of animals that uh, had actually uh, lived in the distant past of the earth, and not, for example, uh, stones uh, that had uh, taken uh, the form of fish uh, shells uh, for astrological influences. Uh, this was one of the uh, common uh, theory uh, of his time in order to explain uh, uh, marine fossils. Leonardo's conclusion was therefore that uh, the reciprocal position of land and seas uh, uh, dramatically changed over time, that uh, the state of the earth was not that uh, created by God. And the Codex Lester contains uh, a very complex uh, theory dealing with uh, these uh, dramatic uh, changes between uh, seas and lands. According to Leonardo, the mountains first emerged from the sea, from the ocean, in the northern hemisphere, to compensate for a downward collapse of land that occurred inside the earth due to underground water erosion. Uh, next slide, please. In this drawing, which is a section of the earth, uh, in this drawing, uh, uh, the underground mass of collapsed earth is schematically represented by an arc dashed in the, in the starting position in the northern hemisphere, the, the red arrow uh, indicates this arc, and empty, next slide please, empty in the final position after the downward collapse towards the southern hemisphere, while the continents that consequently emerged in the northern hemisphere, next slide, are schematically represented by a, a half moon. Leonardo's studies of, of the Earth anticipate modern geology um, from various points of view. But, but uh, what interests us uh, as historians uh, the most is the way, instead typical of his time, the way by which he achieved this complex uh, theory of the Earth by making a different field of knowledge interact different field of knowledge from his own work and different field of knowledge from his time. Uh, next, please. For example, anatomy. Anatomy uh, helped him to understand the geology. His idea of a changing earth with an origin, a development, and the final decay uh, was also a consequence of his intense anatomical studies of how the human body changed in the different ages of, of life. Uh, next, please. Another connection concern, uh, concerns the study of fossils. In this case, his knowledge as a sculptor in the, in the, in the, in the, in the field of bronze statues, uh, casting techniques uh, based on the use of hollow molds and uh, solid models helped Leonardo to understand how uh, shells and fish left uh, in the rocks uh, hollow impressions or on the contrary, uh, 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 solid remains. Uh, next, please. And it is not, not coincidence, perhaps, that uh, in, a, in another manuscript, Manuscript K, uh, drawings uh, of fossils here on the upper right corner uh, are associated with uh, drawings uh, which are studies for uh, uh, decorative motifs in release, so plastic decorative motifs for architecture. Uh, next, please. Uh, finally, uh, we also present uh, in the edition uh, the hypothesis of, of a possible connection between uh, Leonardo's geological theory concerning the first emergence of the continents from the sea and, uh, and the Amerigo Vespucci's uh, contemporary geographical discoveries uh, 
that uh, uh, consisting in the fact that uh, the, the, the lands uh, discovered by Columbus were not the Indies, but an unknown continent, an unknown continent uh, later uh, named after the name of Amerigo, uh, America. We cannot go into details. However, the starting point of Leonardo's geological theory was the hypothesis of the presence of, of, of much water inside the Earth as a consequence of a less presence of marine waters on the surface of the Earth. Vespucci's discoveries of an unknown continent implied just that, uh, less marine waters on the surface of the, of, of the Earth, because there was an unknown continent, an unknown huge mass of, uh, of dry land. Uh, Vespucci was a Florentine, and the news of his uh, discoveries uh, spread to Florence and elsewhere exactly in the very same years in which Leonardo was compiling the Codex Lester, around 1507. So, as you can see, uh, Geology is the result of an interaction between uh, very different fields of knowledge. Uh, and the same is true for astronomy. Uh, Martin can, can tell you better than me on this. Next, please. The outer sheets of the codex, and Domenico will talk a little bit shortly about uh, our idea of outer sheets and inner sheets, uh, different sets of papers. The outer ones are concerned with astronomy. One of the odd things with Leonardo is you would think somebody who is committed to nature and its geometry would be much interested and involved with astronomy. Um, he wasn't for the most part. I think there are two possible um, reasons for this. One is that astronomy was seen as astrologia, was seen as astrology, which he did more than distrust. He actively disliked it. And the other is, I think that the stars are up there. You can't perform an experiment on them. They're in a sense too far away. You could chart their courses, but that was about it. The, the bit of astronomy he becomes interested in is the relationship of light from the sun on the bodies of the Earth and the Moon. And this he could understand by analogy with experiments on, on Earth using a kind of three body problem of a, a light and two bodies which, which receive the light. And he goes in for this very elaborate system of rebounds. And he concludes looking at how light works on the surface of the Moon, that the Moon is actually not some shiny alabaster substance, but that it had seas and lands and the seas cr created wavy water which actually operated to diffuse the light rather than cause very brilliant shiny highlights. The idea that the moon was essentially like the earth, we know it doesn't have seas anymore like, um, like the earth, but the idea that it is an earth-like thing was uh, remarkably revolutionary and he argued it at a very, very effective length. Next, please. Uh, perhaps the most remarkable of the observations of light on the moon and the earth is the lumen cenereum, the ashen light on the moon. This glow that you can see with the new moon and on the right and the bottom right of the, the sheet, which I'm showing you whole, you can see the, the little sliver of crescent moon um, with the light beside it. But what he does, he both looks at that and says, well, there's obviously Earth light reflected back to the moon. Um, th this is this is Earth light we're looking at there in the Lumen Cenereum, the, the ashen light of the moon. But he also thinks, how do we see this next? And he actually looks at how the moon the ashen light near the bright crescent looks darker and how against the blackness of the void behind it looks lighter. This varying field, he writes, is generated because that part of the field which borders on the luminous part of the moon, in comparison to such brightness, shows itself darker than it is. And that part above, where it looks like a piece of luminous circle, uniform width, is generated because here the moon being brighter than the medium or field in which it's located. Campo, he says, a, a field 
in which it's located in comparison to such darkness shows itself on that border more luminous than it is. As far as I know, this is the first time in the history of a science like this, where he's not just said, we can see the phenomenon, but why does it look like it does from the point of view of our perceptual apparatus? He was aware of edge contrast as a painter, that bright borders look very dark, very much brighter against dark, dark borders and so on. But a, a very, very remarkable business of not just what do we see, but how do we see it? Next. Um, this idea of the rebound and one of my jobs in the I assume for myself in the edition was to make the links across with other aspects of Leonardo's work, particularly painting. And this idea of the rebound, the percussione of, uh, of light in the top, you see from manuscript C, a notional experiment of three balls suspended in a rectangular space, a room or whatever, with a light illuminating them and this back reflections. And there in the London Virgin of the Rocks, the Mona Lisa under her chin, you can see this uh, percussione going on, this rebound of, of light from adjacent surfaces. Um, on the whole, the Florentines didn't much like that. Michelangelo wouldn't have done that because it, it, it contradicts the sculptural definition of form in a particular kind of way. Next. And setting us, setting the, the broader context, looking at the body of the earth, Leonardo calls the earth a body of the earth and relating to the notion of the microcosm. I'm not going to read out this rather long quote. It's, um, it's famous enough, but this is in Codex Lester, where he equates waters and rivers with the, with the blood and the veins, um, the bones of, of the rocks, the tufa, the as a, as a tendon. So you've got the body of the woman, the body of the earth absolutely intermingled. Next. And just looking at these drawings, the one of uh, the river management or studying the rivers, the Arno and Munione, west of Florence and the human arm, you don't need me to tell you there's an enormous sense of similarity between the vene d'aqua, as he called them, the, the vessels or veins of water and the vessels in the, in the human arm. And the little inset diagram there, he's showing the veins of the young, which are straight and carry the fluid in an unturbulent manner with the veins of the old, which become wrinkled, tortuous and are prone to silting up. So the, these analogies become very powerful ways of, of thinking about. Uh, you can go from water to aging, which is not something we would from rivers to aging, which is not something we would naturally do ourselves with our present disciplines. Next. Next, can we move on, please? Thank you. Um, always sensing the analogous features of the Earth, the microcosm, the macrocosm, the essential affinity in morphology and physiology and function. On the left page, you've got the vene d'aqua called an albero delle vene, the uh, tree of the vessels. He's obviously thinking of doing a complete uh, chart, as it were, 3D chart of the of the vessels of the of the human body with the main organs and on the right uh, an image of the body of the earth crisscrossed by the vene of water we've already seen domenico doing a ge showed you a geometrically synthesized version of that um, here it's uh, again diagrammatic but uh, it gives a, a more naturalistic sense perhaps of the relationship of the sphere of the water and the protrusions and uh, concave seas of the uh, in the body in the body of the earth and next and a parallel which i've made a number of times and i'm still happy with between the drawing i called the great lady the irrigation system of the female body the multiple irrigation systems and the body of the earth and the body of the woman uh, this is not a preparatory drawing for Mona Lisa, but in a sense, it's a bit of philosophical intellectual preparation for um, the way in which he sets up the, the body of the woman against the body of the earth. Next. 
and going into details um, familiar enough to, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's always worth looking at the movement of water extraordinary drawing at Windsor of the water rushing past this pole and making these hair like swirls the wig of Leda then zooming in on Mona Lisa so we get the shrekles of hair rivulets uh, little currents of hair pouring down towards her bosom and the little rivulets of gathered silk drapery um, and the neckband of her of her garment. Next. And in the Codex Lester, something which had not been looked at very carefully, but uh, bears a lot of thinking about as an experimental tank. Uh, very remarkable to set up an experiment to create effects which are analogous and would stand beside the the ones in the in nature um, the upper drawing on the right there is labeled sperientia experience and consists of a tank full of water with a board vertical board and a rectangular bocca uh, aperture in this case he's blowing he's blowing wind through it to study the relationship of the the waves to the wind and indeed what happens to particulate matter under the under the surface um, that, that the tank is again demonstrated below. But if you look at this very famous drawing from Windsor with the water coming out of a rectangular bocca, it seems to me that this is a synthesis of studies in an experimental tank rather than some miraculous observation of wild nature in the country in the countryside. Next. Um, while we were looking at this, I should say more properly, while well, Domenico was looking at this, he came back to me and he said, I think there are two distinct sets of papers based upon content, based upon our reconstruction of how the sheets were assembled, how the drawings appeared on the sheets. And Domenico will now explain his theory about the two sets of sheets. Well, the, the codex uh, now is, in, the codex uh, is composed of uh, 18 large folded sheets, was composed already. Now these sheets are open and separated, as you can see uh, here, but uh, they were originally bound together uh, when the codex was in the hands of Leonardo. On examining the codex for the edition, we realized differences in compilation between the uh, 11 innermost sheets of the codex and the seven outer pages, the seven outer uh, uh, sheets. Uh, next, please. In the inner uh, sheets, uh, an example here, the text uh, has been inserted uh, in regular and continuous lines. Also, the drawings, as you can see, are regularly arranged along the margins, along the margin. Uh, there are few interruptions uh, and the page is uh, systematically filled in. Instead, if uh, we uh, look at the page from the outer, Sheds. Next slide, please. Uh, we see uh, a different kind of sort of compilation. The text is uh, uh, divided into blocks of varying shape and size, and also the drawings are freely arranged in the page. Now, on the base of these and other evidence, our conclusion has been that uh, the Codex Lester, uh, uh, next slide, please. The Codex Lester were, was the result of Leonardo's unification of two uh, different uh, groups or sets of sheets. Uh, two different uh, uh, sheets compiled uh, separately from each other, even if in, in moments uh, close in time. Uh, now, this is not, uh, not merely philology, but helps us to understand the content of, of, of the Codex. Indeed, these differences in compilation be between these two sections of the Codex, uh, at, to these differences in compilation, correspond differences in content, in the content. Uh, next slide, please. The inner set is... Uh, 
devoted to studies of water, water in its interaction uh, with the soil, so the banks of the rivers and so on. Uh, uh, instead, uh, in, the, in, the, in the outer set, next uh, uh, slide, please. In the outer cells, uh, more general uh, uh, subjects prevails, astronomy and geology. The relationship between uh, these two sections of the codex reflects Leonardo's general style of research, study nature, and imitate or represent it in a paintings, in a machine, or in a scientific theory, because a scientific theory is a form, is also a form of representation of nature. Uh, in the inner set of pages, Leonardo studies, uh, as I say, the water in motion, uh, erosion, water erosion of the banks, all direct all directly visible phenomena. In the outer set of pages, he applies all uh, what he learned about these directly visible phenomena to what he could not directly see, the interior of the earth uh, and its history in geology and the surface and the structure of the moon in, uh, in astronomy. Um, so, as you can see, this is a, a complex uh, structure, a complex codex, Martin, no? is uh, uh, perhaps the most complex of Leonardo's codex. Yeah, indeed, the most complex and given the ones that have survived, probably the most difficult of them all to master. Um, it, at some point, it became separated from the great body of Leonardo's manuscripts, which went with uh, French years his learned pupil and uh, who guarded the manuscripts very carefully. And it, it achieved an independent existence. Uh, very challenging, but it very remarkably had an impact. Now, we don't have to justify Leonardo's science by saying, oh, he had this influence and he altered this and he altered that. But in this case, we can do what is relatively conventional science. And we can say this manuscript was known. It was. Uh, available and it was used and Domenico not the least original part of his research has been to look at the Fortuna at the history of the codex oh, after, after, after Leonardo and once it had escaped from the, the main body of work so um, it, it's, it's all yours Domenico. Yeah okay next slide please. So the history of the code. Le Leonardo never published his manuscript, his manuscript in print, and this led scholars to believe that uh, his scientific work remained substantially unknown before the modern edition of his manuscript, with very few and very limited ex exceptions. Now, uh, thanks to the study for the, uh, the edition of nine manuscript copies of the Codex Lester, you see here some examples. Thanks to this, we can now say uh, instead that Leonardo's scientific ideas circulated more than assumed so far, especially in the 18th century. Uh, these manuscript copies, of course, transcribed Leonardo's text into normal handwriting, making the content of the codex more, much more accessible also to the scientists. Uh, next, please. The history of the Codex Lester begins in 16th century Rome, when uh, it belongs, belonged to Guglielmo della Porta. Guglielmo della Porta was not only a sculptor, but also an hydraulic engineer who, for example, worked on the aqueduct who brought water to the Trevi Fontaine in Rome. Therefore, his interest in the Codex Lesser was not generic. Uh, Guglielmo was also a member of a large community of Milanese, Northern Italian uh, engineers and architects living in Rome, uh, who sometimes uh, wrote uh, treatises, uh, like Camillo Agrippa. Next, please. Like Camillo Agrippa, 
whose books uh, uh, printed in Rome at the end of the 16th, 16th century contains uh, uh, parts highly evocative of the content of the Codex uh, Lester. Uh, for these hydraulic engineers, uh, Leonardo became a kind of, uh, of a model, a symbol of the cultural value of their work as uh, technicians, as uh, engineers. Next, please. Uh, later on, starting from the end of the 16th century, the interest shifted towards another aspect of the codex, geology. This was indeed the period in which modern geology uh, began to develop in modern uh, sense. And if we look at the places where the codex and its copies circulated, not surprisingly, these are also key centers for the, the, the development of the new geology. Naples, Rome, Florence, Weimar in Germany, Paris, London. Let me give you just a few examples. Next, please. London. Uh, in London, starting from 1719, uh, the Codex Lester and uh, uh, its copy were in the house of uh, Thomas Cook, Earl of Leicester, who bought the Codex during his Grand Tour in Italy. Uh, his London house uh, was uh, uh, frequented by important uh, British uh, scientists, and we have collected evidence uh, of their interest towards uh, Leonardo. Uh, next, please. Naples, another copy of the Codex Lester ended up in Naples, which in these years was one of the main centers for the study of the new geology uh, for the uh, dramatic eruptions of Vesuvius. Uh, next, please. Another place, Paris. Uh, in Paris, uh, uh, Leonardo's scientific uh, theories, and in particular Leonardo's geological theories, uh, were discussed among scientists not only as uh, historical curiosity, but uh, as uh, uh, inspiring theories for the ongoing geological uh, uh, research. And finally, uh, next slide. Uh, shortly afterward, uh, another copy of the Codex uh, arrived in Germany, in Weimar, thanks to the interest of the great German poet and uh, geologist, uh, Johann Wolfgang uh, Goethe. So, as, as you can see, uh, uh, what we have discovered is an un unsuspected scenario of circulation are those uh, scientific ideas, at least for the Codex Lester, uh, a, a scenario stimulating further research on, on, on his legacy as a scientist. We know, we know uh, much more about his legacy as an artist, his fortune as an artist and, and, and as an art theorist, but we know uh, much less uh, on his legacy as a, as a scientist. So the, I would say this is the first step for, for, a, for a further research, I would say like that. Martin, can you, would you like to add something? Just a, just a quick summing up. I, I think everybody can tell how good it was working with Domenico on this and mm -hmm. uh, how much I, I benefited from it. And it's been a, a good partnership. Thanks also to Catherine Steele and Oxford University Press it's been a long haul and uh, it seemed at various points that we never get there to this point but we have we have got there i think looking back on it it's certainly the most comprehensive uh, interpretive machinery provided for any leonardo codex um, and we were able to do that because of bill gates's support without his support we couldn't have spent that amount of time and energy and yeah. effort in bringing this to a, a conclusion. And I think it probably matches up with any manuscript, scientific manuscript from from any period. But that's a rather rather more dangerous, uh, rather more dangerous claim. Um, we're planning to put the edition online, and uh, you'll be receiving further news of that in due course. So. Uh, we initially began by with an electronic edition, but in fact, the print edition, as it were, took over the electronic one, and that's the one which we've which we've now oh. produced. 
And could I also thank Curtis Wong, who is who is with us now for really starting the whole thing in the late 1990s. And uh, Curtis, it seemed like a long time, but um, I hope the results are worth waiting for. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, Domenico. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us and for your patience with the technical difficulties at the start. But I hope you'll agree that um, the wait was worthwhile. Um, and uh, yes, just to reinforce what Martin has just said, the, the four volume print edition is currently available. Um, actually, my colleague uh, Kate will post into the chat box um, a, a, a discount code which you can use on our website. Um, if you did want to buy the edition after this evening's wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, yes, in in early 2021, we're planning, um, it's currently in um, the process of being added to our Oxford Scholarly Editions online platform, which will be a really worthwhile, um, uh, which will be really worthwhile and will preserve the work for generations to come, which is very exciting for us. Um, so uh, we've got a couple of questions uh, come in and everyone please feel free to um, send your questions through on the chat. Um, uh, we, that would be great to hear from you um, or comments. Um, we have one question that says, I wonder whether Leonardo's apprentices might have been shown and learnt from the contents of the Codex Lester. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. First, first go at that. Um, the only one of Leonardo's immediate circle who would have understood it, and this is a difficult one, would be Francesco Melzi, who was a, a young nobleman, a dis distinguished family from the Milanese area. Um, Leonardo stayed in the Villa Melzi um, near Vaprio Dada, and uh, it was he who had a decent education and could have grappled with this. I think the the other pupils, however good they were at painting, particularly the Milanese ones like Boltraffio and Gian Petrino, this would have been, uh, to use a colloquialism, double Dutch, or um, it would have uh, passed them by. I don't know how, Domenico, what do you think about that? Mm. You missed that, Domenico, did you? Oh, oh sorry. Yes, yes, um, I, I think uh, uh, there, there, there is a strange, there is a, um, in, in one of the Paris manuscripts, uh, there is a, 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 a page uh, with, uh, with a note by Francesco Melzi, uh, possibly, almost certainly by Francesco Melzi, in which uh, he writes uh, about something and he quotes uh, and he say about something that uh, this, this, this happened 50, uh, 57 thousand uh, uh, years ago, which is a, a, a conception of deep time correlated to geology. Uh, and so could be a first cue uh, in uh, in uh, trying to understand uh, if Melzi could have uh, uh, could could have possibly been interested in the con in the geological content of the codex, uh, but uh, just a cue. Um, for example, the only the only evidence I collected is about Camillo Agrippa. The, the, I, I showed uh, uh, his book before. Camillo Agrippa it was not uh, from the workshop of Leonardo, but was uh, um, from the northern Italy and was linked to other artists who possibly had access to Leonardo's uh, drawings, like, like, uh, like Carlo Urbino, the authors of the Codex Huygens. So in order to 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 have a better question to this, we have to work more uh, in the Milanese lay second in the Milanese context from the say, of the second half of the 16th century. Melzi is an can be an important link uh, for this. Uh, thank you very much, both. Um, I wonder. I've got a question here from Nicholas, um, who asks. What evidence is there that it was Leonardo who joined the two parts of the manuscript? <laughs> Martin, for you or for me? <laughs> it's for you. <laughs> Either or. <laughs> this, 
<ride> allora, listen, uh, there is no clear evidence, but I, uh, what we know is that the Codex Lester, as, uh, uh, before it was disbanded, uh, really um, seems to have been uh, in that condition when it was in Leonardo's uh, hand. The, there are um, internal uh, links between some pages and the others. Uh, there is, a, for example, a page, uh, a sheet in which Leonardo uh, make a reference, makes a reference to a, to a nearby sheet. Uh, and this was added after the codex was bounded because there are paleographic evidence in order to say that. It is difficult to uh, answer to these questions uh, uh, without images. Uh, the person interested can contact us. We can uh, help more uh, in other ways, but honestly, it, it is difficult uh, to answer. Uh, one thing uh, is uh, that uh, the, the numbers I can add is the, 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 the numbers of the page of the codex are not by Leonardo, so were added later. And uh, uh, our uh, impression is that uh, uh, Leonardo put together these uh, two uh, different groups of sheets without numbering uh, them. So uh, he, he didn't consider uh, it like a, 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 a finished codex. No? Uh, even the, 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 the cover, what is considered the card cover or the original cover of the codex, uh, we, without that it is really the, 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 the cover of the codex in Leonardo's time. So it is more likely in our view that these were just a collection of, uh, of pages, of sheets that he put together, but that he didn't consider as a, a, a finished work, a finished codex. Yeah. I think there are a number of places uh, where you can see that having got the sheets assembled, that he then uh, made little references and uh, added various things. Yeah. I discussed this, uh, I wrote an essay called Compilation and Chaos, yeah. which, you know, a title which satisfies my liking of such things. And um, I, I, I look there at the way the whole thing has been assembled and try to build up a sequence. So I think it is with little clues, it's possible to say, yes, they were put together like that in Leonardo's own time, and they were not simply cobbled together by some later owner. Um, yes, I remember some of this uh, when we were delivering the manuscript of um, making sure that we got the pages in the right order in the actual, um, in our printed book too. Um, so yeah. I, I, I think I know a tiny bit of the, of the complication. <laughs> Um, if I could just ask a question of my own, if that's not too um, too cheeky, I just wondered if you could tell us a tiny bit about um, your experience of working with such, um, you know, just such an incredible piece of history um, as this manuscript, you know, in sort of practical terms, like what, um, you know, how did you, how did you sort of physically do it? And also, how did you kind of feel about interacting with such a document? Yeah, I, I, let me go first on that, and Domenico can then pick up when when he came in. Um, when Curtis Wong uh, asked me to do the uh, or to be the consultant for the CD-ROM we did, I thought I knew the Codex Lester reasonably well. I mean, I'd written about the in, the relationship between various aspects of Leonardo's thinking, but with seventy thousand words of such complexity and such extraordinary of thinking and observation and such tumbling complexity of uh, thinking. Uh, you think you've got a decent knowledge of it, but you then work through it and it becomes absolutely transformed. And asking the very specific questions we did when we came to the printed edition about the compilation of the sheets, how did he take a sheet, how did he go through it? And there's all there's a very elaborate business of he counts at various points what he calls casi or propositioni um, or conclusioni. He calls them various things. 
and he goes through each sheet counting um, how many propositions or Kazi cases he's made. Um, and that is a very extraordinary thing to do. And I've never really paid attention to that and was able to get out things I a hadn't noticed or B thought were inexplicable. So that sustained work did uh, transform my understanding of the Codex Lester and dealing with Leonardo with anything he does is both thrilling and frustrating. It's thrilling because the quality of what he does, the visual quality, the intellectual quality is just extraordinary. And he does remain uh, an absolute pinnacle of a certain kind of way of, of looking at things. Um, it's frustrating because he goes from one thing to another, that he always sees something as something else. He sees hair as water. He sees um, uh, hair, the circling of hair as relating to philotaxis in plants and so on. So it's this continual splashing over. It's a rather an appropriate metaphor for it from one area to another. And it's incredibly stimulating seeing something as something else and breaking down these boundaries. But at points you think, keep going with that. Come on, <laughs> you know, keep going, get it. You're almost there. And he's off into something else. And it's uh, it, he's he's often called a polymath. I call him a monomath because he can always see how everything relates to something else in a unified field theory in a way. Uh, <laughs> So, no, it's it's an enormous privilege to deal with one of the great things human beings can do. We can do some pretty terrible things to each other, as we well know. But um, um, working with Leonardo is is a huge privilege. Domenico, sorry, that's rather a long right. <laughs> What 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 what? Yes, was a was a, an exciting uh, experience for me too. Working on Leonardo. It's a privilege because all of us are fascinated by the beauty of nature and art. And in Leonardo, you find the, the two, both connect to each other in the best way as possible. In particular, the, my this experience of research on the Codex Lesser has been an exciting experience. Ten years, it lasted ten years, so almost a part of my life. And uh, it changed me uh, various ways. For example, I, for uh, before studying the Codex Lesser, my main area of research was anatomy, the history of anatomy. And uh, after the study of the Codex Lesser, uh, I'm also uh, devoted the uh, time of research to the history of geology which are linked, of course, from Leonardo's point of view, the, the study of the body or the earth, the study of the human body. So exciting experience. Thank you both very much. Um, and uh, we have another question here, which actually um, strays away from the codex a little bit, but it goes to Da Vinci. Um, uh, the, um, the person asks, um, I'd like to use this opportunity to ask, um, a question about the Mona Lisa. Um, everybody probably knows that there is a hill behind a sitter, but it is a strange hill, totally bald, colour is brown and it is divided by several lines. Do you ever think that this is no hill at all, but possibly some different object? Um, and they also ask about the inscription inside the Mona Lisa painting. If you had any thoughts? Well, this is for Martin. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah there is a peculiar rather smeary sort of brown area to the right of Mona Lisa as you look at her near her left shoulder. Um, I think it's either an area of uh, denoting a hill or some kind of landscape feature which has either deteriorated or was never quite finished. Um, even Leonardo's finished paintings uh, often have, have areas in them that you think was that quite finished. It's not something I've looked at in detail but um, it, it is a peculiar and unexplained feature which we tend to overlook. You know, we're so obsessed with seeing what we want to see in Mona Lisa that something like that we tend to not to see. What was the second part of the question? Uh, inscriptions. inscriptions. Sorry, sorry, I was I was muted. Um, no. uh, your opinion about the possible inscription inside the inside the painting? 
there is no inscription inside Mona Lisa. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> Succinct. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Completely. Um, well, that, um, that's all. Um, that's all the questions on the chat. Um, if anybody else would like to ask any questions, um, perhaps you could put your hand up now. Otherwise, I think we will draw this to a close. Um, and thank you for allowing us to go over time or to um, not not go over time so much as recapture our time from the beginning. <laughs> thank you. Um, that seems to be that seems to be it. So um, it just uh, is left to me to thank Martin and Domenico very much um, for both their wonderful work on this um, beautiful edition um, and uh, also for this um, great presentation. And we're very much looking forward to the online edition um, coming in uh, 2021, all being well. Um, and uh, yeah, keep an eye out for it. I think you'll be most impressed. And uh, yeah, please. Please do take advantage of the um, of the discount code which has been posted in the chat. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.